When you're building a product, you've got an objective. You're building something to solve a specific problem. So to do that, you, you need to track. You can't know where you're going unless you have specific markers that you're hitting. And you need to be able to track progress. And the only way to track progress is to actually have those metrics. Look at them on a daily, weekly, monthly, annual basis. And to follow that journey to building a great sticky product that customers love. So the first thing I would do is, is go, what's your main objective? What does your business stand for? What is the metric that best aligns with that objective? Then you can go from there and trickle down to all of the component parts and then go back upwards. Welcome back to Purpose Driven Fintech. I'm your host, Moni Millares. Today, we speak with Jazz Shah, independent fintech product consultant at Bitso. Jazz shares with us the importance of data metrics in building purpose driven fintechs. We go deep and practical. We start by defining what makes great product and the role of metrics in product development. We give examples across fintech verticals to bring it to life. Defining metrics is not enough. We deep dive into the challenges like confirmation bias and tools necessary for efficient product growth, including A-B testing and the potential of AI. If you enjoy, please subscribe or follow in your favorite platform. Jazz, welcome back. Thank you so much. Hey, Molly. Good to be back. Hello, hello. Thanks for having me. Thank you. No, this is silly, but I was probably so excited to record this conversation that I showed off 30 minutes before. It's always better to be early than to be late. So exactly. That's yeah. So that's a sign of how important this conversation is, which it is because we're going to talk about data metrics, which basically that is a key part of our businesses. But before we get into it, this podcast is about how can we build more purpose-driven fintechs. So what is your take? Yeah. You could do some magic editing because obviously we've, spoken before, but I will be consistent. So I'll say the same thing to save some editing time for you. So for me, generally building more purpose-driven fintechs mean giving the people who already have the drive and determination to solve a problem, the tools to be able to design and build a solution, take it to market to solve that problem. So I guess the, the really easy examples to point to are, we were at Dubai Fintech Summit months ago nick strawski was on stage talking about revolut nick nick is a great example of someone who faced the problem himself he was he worked as a trader he was frustrated with the amount of fx fees he was paying um, i won't dive into what he was paying those fx fees on but he was frustrated with that process why am i giving back all this money and he was like i'm going to build something that solved this problem for me and other people i know and he had that inherent drive and determination to solve it and he knew what the challenges were and i think we need to you've got nick you've got tom Anne from starling um the wise co-founders the stripe the collison brothers from stripe there's so many examples of the big fintechs that we look at today those founders have usually faced those problems themselves and so really inherently understand it that's not to say you have to have felt the problem to, to solve it. It's just, it's a bit easier to have that drive and determination to enter when you face setbacks to still keep going because you know, look, this is really a problem that I felt and I really want to solve it. For me, it's giving more founders who face those problems, the tools, the funds and the opportunity to go solve them. And I, mm -hmm. I think that's how we create more pers purposeful fintechs across the board. So I want to build on that. So we go and solve those problems. Usually the solution ends up being a product most of the times or a service. So what's your definition of a great product? Yeah, a great product. I think a great product has a few different defining attributes. It's unique and innovative. Often nowadays it leverages modern tech. It's customer centric, it's valuable, it solves an ongoing problem and it's quite clear what the product is, who it's for and what it's doing. So it's unique as in it's not a complete copycat, innovative in that it solves problems in different ways, customer centric and designed with the customer's needs and wants in mind. Valuable in that it actually gives something back to the customer. It, it usually, usually it 
gives the customer time back or some sort of convenience or takes away risk. That's most financial products do that in some form. And then clear clarity. I think this is something that it's, it's part of the job really to bring clarity to what the solution is, whether that's in a strategy document, whether that's in a roadmap, whether that's in a vision or mission statement, product clarity needs to go to the end user, whether that's a, it could be a B2B product that could be a business or it could be a consumer. It's just bringing that clarity and the, the best products have all of those attributes. Yeah. I, I like to, yeah, I like to think that it's a difficult, it's a difficult thing to balance though. So I think when people are building products, you get a certain amount of chips. Like you go into a casino, you get a certain amount of chips and you could put them on the roulette table in these specific areas, but no, no founder, no builder gets unlimited chips. So they might get 10 chips and they have to select where they're going to allocate these 10 chips. Look, am I going to create a really innovative brand new solution solving a new problem? Am I putting all my chips here or am I putting eight of my chips here and two on technology? Am I building a competing product, but making sure it's way clearer than everything that already exists? So I think you're usually working within those parameters and you have a certain number of chips to allocate and it's figuring out where the best place to put those chips at the early stages. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I think we could talk for an hour just about great products. That actually we did, yeah. right? That was our first we podcast, did, yeah. just like one hour of what makes great products. But I think you gave like a really good summary in a five minute <laughs> uh, conversation instead. But one of the realities of fintech is we can brag about our great products, but at the end of the day, shareholders want returns, right? And then the how we show that we are on track towards meeting those returns and those expectations is basically show me the data, show me the metrics. And that's why this conversation today is so important because like we need to measure the impact as such of, of, of the things that we're building. So can you expand on what is the role of metrics in this whole process of creating great products. It, it, it plays a central role, right? So I like to use analogies. I think anyone who's read any of my stuff will see, I'll probably put an analogy in every single, every single thing I've written, every panel I've been on, every speaking event I've been to. I think, uh, I think I'd ask you a question right now. So I'd say, are you a healthy person? Do you, yes. How do you know you're a healthy person? Because of my habits. Because of your and habits. My blood, and my blood test. Both. And, I measured yeah. them both. And I, and I think it's understanding you have an objective. When you're building a product, you've got an objective. You're building something to solve a specific problem. We'll, get, we'll probably get into North Star metrics and what they mean. But usually you're building this. Everyone says B, B H A G, big, hairy, audacious goal. But you'll have an objective in mind. And usually fitness goals are like, oh, I want to, I want to be healthier or I, tw I want to be fitter. And to do that, you, you need to track usually what you're, e what you're eating, what you're putting into your body, what you're doing to become healthier. I've got Fitbit as well, right? Fitbit and Whoop have made, have basically made a business of metric, health metrics. They've, com they've made complete business models out of just one part tracking metrics to become healthier. That's what they do. Mixed panel and Amplitude have done it for products, for digital products generally. But you can't, you can't know where you're going unless you have specific markers that you're hitting. And you need to be able to track progress. And the only way to track progress is to actually have those metrics, look at them on a daily, weekly, monthly, annually, annual basis. And that's the only way to, to, come, to track process and to, and to follow that, that journey to building a Great sticky product that customers love. Metrics are so important. You're right. That analogy, the sports analogy is so good. The healthy analogy. It's, I love my Fitbit. It's it. It's, it's helping me change my habits. And I love the graphics and I graph. <laughs> so, I, so I put yeah. the time checking them out. And they built an amazing business based on data and metrics. It's not just a watch. It's like what the watch gives you. But then 
data and metrics are core to what we're doing. So let's start at the start at the beginning, the very, very basics. If we are a product team and we haven't, we have never done this before, or it's the new head of product or the new PM is coming into the organization and they're like, oh, surprisingly, they don't have a good metric system here. So how do we get started on metrics? I think that there's two approaches. Uh, there's bottom up. There's going, looking at all of the different functions within the product, like how the product achieves its goal through things like onboarding, decision-making, risk assessments, dispersing finance, email, email campaigns, all of that stuff. You can go bottom up and add metrics to each of those, but my preference is to start top down. And again, it's, you know, if you have a product strategy deck or, or document, or you've got a vision, a mission statement, you've got this core objective, although it's a difficult task, you can assign one metric, one big metric that overarches everything in the organization, but aligns with that objective, right? An easy example to use is probably Stripe, right? Stripe started out as we were a credit, US-based credit card processor. So they had that niche. Really want to, their main objective is volume of transactions and amount of transactions with a lowest amount of default rates or return rates on those transactions. So low fraud, high success transactions and high transaction amounts. That's, that's their big North Star objective. And as they've expanded that North Star, has, you've shaved niches off it, but it's still largely the same. It's process as many transactions as possible with as large amount as possible. But they've, it, it's changed from transactions to just finance overall. So now it's financial infrastructure for the internet. That's their big, that's their uh, mission statement or tagline. And so the metric is quite tightly aligned to that. It's still give as much finance to businesses as possible and help businesses grow through. Now it's through those different niches. So credit card processing payments, giving finance, setting up businesses. So they've just abstracted that North Star metric and made it more generic, but it's still the metric that sits at the top and then everything feeds up into it. So the first thing I would do is, is go, what's your main objective? What does your business stand for? What's it trying to do? What's your fintech's big, hairy, audacious goal? What is the metric that best aligns with that objective? that you could look at every day and say that we're making progress, we're making progress. Then go, then you can go from there and trickle down to all of the, to all of the component parts. So you're breaking down an equation really, and you're just doing the bracket bits, breaking it down to each component part and then going back upwards. That's how I'd approach it. It's tricky. I think it's tricky to just look at the, that main objective, that, that big objective and try and assign a number to it. But it requires analysis, it requires understanding of the component parts and, and trying to define it is, is the tough thing. But that's why product's not an easy, it's not a straightforward job to, to come in and define metrics for an organization that hasn't done it before. So could you use that as your go-to framework or could you use like another standard industry framework? I think, again, it's relatable and it, it's easy to turn into an analogy. So I'll say, look, why does North Star exist? It's literally called North Star because it's the thing that everyone can look to and define direction. I haven't named it. The industry over time, that's just the name that's come out um, for that term. And then you can go, it's the thing on top of the Christmas tree and you can literally map out a metrics hierarchy as this is our North Star. Here are all of our component parts. And here are all the metrics that feed into that North Star. And yeah. it, often it is easier to use industry standards because people come from different teams and they might already have a baseline understanding of what a North Star metric is. So when you're explaining it, some of the work has already been done for you. And that's why North Star, 
I'll use Northstar as that top-down, top-down explainer because it's just a bit easier. You're taking people on less of a journey and it requires less explanation. Fintech, that journey, because like you say, it's a journey. That journey in Fintech is very specific to Fintech. So the Fintech products are very financial products, right? What could be the metrics that we need to look at? Yeah. See, they're financial. Most of the metrics, if you look at, again, if you just boil everything down, if you look at payments, if you look at lending, if you look at savings, pensions, cards, I might just try to think like literally deposits, a so current account, it all boils down to volume and transaction amounts usually. So it's it, yeah. volume and like number of customers doing and depositing number of customers putting a certain amount of money somewhere. So that could be number of customers put using their card and making e-commerce transactions. That could be number of customers, an average amount saved, deposited monthly or annually. That could be number of customers putting uh, X percent into a pension. That could be number of customers put it investing through Coinbase or through free trade. And for, for banks, that could be number and volume of customers and average deposit amounts. And again, go to lending, it's usually number of customers through the door and number of uh, amount of finance dispersed to those customers, applied for and dispersed. So I think if you, mostly you can boil it down to that. And I guess that's what I will often say to, to an organization like, okay, you're a fintech, you do this, you, your North Star is probably something along the lines of this, and then insert the key, the key words here, that's probably your North Star, does it align with your objective? And if it doesn't, it might require some tweaks, but mostly you can boil it down to that, like some volume of transactions and customers and average transaction amounts usually. And you're looking for that number to be as high as possible. And flipping it on its head, you've got things like broad products, AML products, it, it's just the opposite of that. People looking at what hack like number of the lowest number of transactions, uh least amount of transactions, fraudulent transactions. Like that that's our number that that we'll go give out to potential clients. Well we've got the lowest fraud rates of any platform. Transaction monitoring, we cat or we catch the most amount of fraud. So I think it's again, it can all be pretty much distilled down to volume and amounts. Yeah. As product teams, let's assume that we have done that thinking, right? And we have the metrics as such. Challenge that we'll get from management is move the metrics, move the yeah. number now, right? So starting with the defining the metrics is the first step. How do we move those metrics? Yeah, that's where the, the deep breath in is because that's where all the word experimentation comes into it, right? You yeah. can't move the metric without doing some level of experimentation. And again, if we go back to the fitness analogy, you've got an objective, you've got a fitness objective, you want to get fitter, you want to run faster. Usually you're like, okay, let's try some different food. Let's try some different fueling methods. Let's do different types of running. Let's do some sprints and then some long distance running. Um, and it's the same when you're trying to move the metric in FinTech. You have to have a, you have to have a good set of ideas allocated to that area. So I get, and I, and I go back to an example that, that is really relevant to what I'd done before, which is in lending, what a, in SME lending, one of the main objectives is get as many people through the door and as get, get them as much finance that we could possibly disperse with the lowest default rate possible. But that's a kind of three component top line. North Star metric for most mm -hmm. SME lenders. Prove me wrong. I, I haven't heard any North Star that's any different to, to what I just described. But when you go, when you look, if someone says, oh, I'll improve that metric, you have to, again, like I said earlier, go back to its component part. How many people are we getting through? If it's a fully digital onboarding process, how many people are we getting landing on our website? How many people are we getting clicking? on the apply for finance link or connect account link. How many people are going from that to actually using the product? 
how many people from using a product are actually using it every day, every week, every month, and then looking at customer lifetime value and figuring out that if we keep a customer for 12 months, the statistic likelihood is they will take out finance. Do we, how do we reduce that number down to six months or seven months? Or how do we speed up onboarding for people who want finance like that? They're coming in to get finance. How do we reduce those lead times? So if you're, if you're talking about moving that top line metric, that North Star, you have to look at all of those component parts. How do we bring more people in? How do we reduce those those times? How do we get finance to people faster, but efficiently and securely? How do we process, keep an eye on SME health, for example? Mm-hmm. Like how do we consistently see the boat making repayments, usually three repayments yeah. or six repayments or 12 repayments a year uh, on our finance agreement? And how do we reduce default rates or collection rates or co- uh, the end uh, collection process that sometimes happens if um, SMEs don't uh, default on their lending agreement. So it come, again, it comes down to could those, looking at those component parts and going, here are the component parts. What are the metrics for each of these component parts? What's an area that we could really improve quite easily? Often that's getting more people through the door or the middle part, which is the decision-making process, doing risk tiering and making that more effective. Yes. You explain a real life example, right? Like a real product uh, within FinTech. What, what I was thinking, it's like you and I were both FinTech product professionals, but the, we have a different perspective because like you lately have been acting as a consultant, you, you meet many fintechs while for the past many years i've been within the fintech right so i see one fintech in depth so my question like from your perspective when you meet all these fintechs i would assume that they do this already and that they do it right what's your experience some do and some don't that i think that yeah so when you, yeah, some don't do it right, but I'd say right from my definition, which is having built products for 16 years, my view of right is different to their view of right. And I think it also goes back to that point about going into a casino, going to a roulette table and only having a certain number of chips. Usually what I've seen is they have not done it right because they just have not had the time, expertise or resources or pro- or or the pro, the having been overriding pro to do it at that time. Uh, yeah. So a hundred percent. Yeah, and that and that's it because I can relate. I, I did that exactly. That's it. You know, I'm I'm sure you, you you have conversations with lots of people, and I'm sure they they say the same thing. It's oh, we just we want to do that. We just don't have time to do that right now. Yeah, capacity. Uh, yeah. And look, let's use the old cliche. Oh, it's on our roadmap. We are. It's on our roadmap just means, yeah, we want to do it. We just haven't been able to do it yet. We might do it. We might not. And, and mostly that's a debate. Oh, that's a challenge around prioritizing other competing things, time, money often. Yeah. We want to plug in a segment. We want to connect a mixed panel. We want five or six dashboards and we want reports going to salespeople and marketing folks and CEOs and hooked directly into the town hall pitch deck or like the pitch deck for the all hands. And it's like, that's time and effort. You have to go often for lots of these metrics tools, you have to still go into the code base. You still have to, and you also still have to know exactly where to write in these calls. So you want to track conversion. That means you have to track when a customer lands on a page, pull in cookies and then create a profile in a database somewhere of this person that's maybe anonymized at that point. And then when they type in their name, it gets saved in various phases and then it gets gets exposed to mixed panel or amplitude or, or another such tool. That's time and effort. At the moment, it's not, f- I'm sure we'll get to a point where you could just write an AI prompt into mixed panel and it would be connected to GitHub and then 
because of what you've written, it would go, oh, I'm going to write these calls here and it would create this mix panel output. You test it and it's all good. That would be brilliant. We're not there yet. So no. it's still time and effort. Yet, yet. Yes, exactly. So talking about all these tools, A-B testing has to be part of this conversation, right? Because you have the metrics, you're experimenting, and then you're like, you hear someone in the room saying, oh, let's A-B test. What are the conditions that we need to have or criteria that we need to have when we're thinking about A-B testing so that we can move these metrics? First, yeah, I think A-B testing is a lot harder than people think. Mm -hmm. It does require planning. And like you said, what are the conditions? What are you trying to measure? Is again, the first, what's the point of this experiment? A-B testing is just an experiment. I did a physics A-level and usually you have an objective of the experiment. You're trying to, you're trying to prove something. You're trying to prove a hypothesis. And to do that, you might change one variable and you'll run that scenario 15 or 20 different times, but you, you have to know what you're looking for. And often people will A-B test without any kind of real overriding hypothesis. They'll A-B test for the sake of it. And they might get, uh, they might get confirmation bias of something that they assume, but they haven't written it down on paper and that's not the objective of, of the experiment. So and the, the, the biggest thing is, but if you're A-B testing, what are you A-B testing? Why are you doing it? What are you looking to get out of it? Map that out. Then go A-B test. And you might see things that are outliers. You might see things that don't fit into what you initially thought, which is great because they're still learnings. But you can't, some people look at the outliers and go, oh, that's what I thought. We, we don't, the team don't know. People running the, the experiments don't know. A-B testing doesn't, also doesn't necessarily have to be a, a proper system A-B test. It could be like you create a new customer journey in Figma and you present it to a customer True. and you go, oh, this is our current journey. This is our new projected journey. What do you think? But I, that's still very general. You still need an objective. Is the objective to make that customer journey clearer for the customer? And in which case you need to answer those, ask those specific questions. What do you think about the clarity of the journey? Or is it to make it faster? And if it's to make it faster, again, you collect the data from those experiments and then you review them. But you have to review them under that, that mindset of, here was our, was our objective as part of this A-B, um, A-B test. Here's, what's, here, here's what the outcomes are and here's what we've learned. Lots of people will go into that with no, with no objective, yeah. with no um, hypothesis. And it, it's a bit of a waste of the test because it's not, again, doing A-B testing, is, it's quite, it can be intensive. It can be cheap and easy. People who do all of the upfront effort to literally create a b testing frameworks as part of the line product and code base that it's easy for them but they've done all of that mm -hmm. upfront work so the cost is just done up front and not spread over time but lots of folks will do a b testing they'll just spend a month trying to set it up they'll do the test they'll gather the data and they'll be like we haven't learned anything because we, we haven't really set it up properly yeah so building on those quote unquote mistakes, what could be, what are the top challenges that product teams have when it comes to building metrics? Building metrics, oh, there's so many challenges. I think again, confirmation bias is one and that can come from having a, a, a huge hypothesis and setting up your experiment to simply prove it. I I have done this in the past before where I've thought something and then I've gone I'm going to get some customer data, but I've handpicked the customer data to fit my thesis. I haven't looked at everything. I've just looked at the data that proves my point. So that for me, that's a risk because then you, usually if you're the product person who's going to refinement and suggesting what should go into the next, into the next sprint, what should be built, built into the product next. You'll sometimes, you'll bring some data to the conversation. You'll speak to it. Yes. Yeah. You'll have a discussion. So-and-so is saying this, we need to do this technical change. We need to improve this. And then I'll come up. We need to do this and actually look at all this customer data that says, this will make a really big impact to our conversion. And I've already looked at a specific niche of customers. Maybe I haven't looked at every, the breadth of customers. I haven't looked at the breadth of data that's there. So confirmation bias 
it's definitely it's definitely one of biggest. one of the big challenges. Yeah. 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 I also think not having a metrics framework is a very big challenge. Uh, yeah. But it, I think not having the tools there. Yeah. But yeah, I think the confirmation bias when it's the most important, right? Because if you do have some sort of data, you need to ensure that you are looking at that objectively rather than trying to prove your point. Yeah, yes. It's, and it, I think it's very difficult to do that because we're humans. And I think maybe that's where, mm -hmm. that's where AI is very good. It should be able to take, as long as you ask the right questions, it should take your individual bias out of it. So if yes. you ask the question without bias, it will give you an answer without bias. And it can look across, and it can look across all data points, give it a specific, maybe give it a specific time span and give it a specific objective. We've got this. Here's my assumption. What are your thoughts? Look at the data, scan the data. Is there anything that's, yeah. Yeah. And I want to elaborate on that because exactly, we upload all this data into AI platform. And then we, our prompt is, hey, can you look at this data and find evidence that my customers are unhappy because of this and I need to build this feature? the machine will go and answer the question, right? <laughs> Versus, hey, you upload the data and you say, we are trying to build an, and we are trying to figure out why customers are not engaged and we've had some drop-offs. Here's the data. Act as a product consultant and a data scientist, go. And it will give you something, but that's different to find the answer to this biased question. Same set of data, different prompts. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Don't, don't ask as a product consultant. Just ask, you can, you can come ask me is that. Um, as but, jazz. But, but, yeah, exactly. That, that, but that is, that's red car theory, right? So that's, you've got the uh, psychological experiment where you, you, you take two people, you ask them how many red cars they saw today, give you the number. Yes. And then you ask one person the next ask them both the next day and then they'll the number will be significantly higher, higher because they are yeah, now looking for red cars because the, the seed has been implanted in their mind that oh yeah that's a great point i have not, not been looking for I'm specifically counting red cars so i don't know maybe it's three the next day it's 15 what yeah bias is baked into how you set up the question and then also from a human perspective how you process data and, and give a response so yeah. the ai on metrics for for fintech specifically i think will be one of the bigger uh, we'll get into an ai discussion i'm sure at some point in the future but in the product space i think that's where it's going to have the biggest impact because again if you look at what ai is gonna good at, very good at processing large amounts of data most fintechs most banks most insurers have a lot of data too much to make sense. Every big financial services organization will, will tell you that if, if they're being honest. We've got so much data, we actually don't know what to do with it. We have teams of people trying to analyze it, but it's very difficult. AI is very good at that. And it's also very, also very good at taking bias out. So if you ask it the right questions, you'll get responses which could drive better outcomes for customers overall. Yeah. Given all these challenges and opportunities, often should we be looking at our metrics? I'm going to cheat. I'm going to say it depends on the metric. Oh, uh, Yes. And, I think and, that's a good and, answer. Yeah. It de and it depends on how you've set your framework up. So I think if you look every day, I think you could get, again, you could get metric fatigue. You could be looking at a metric every day and every day you're going, oh, yesterday I had four customers onboarded. Today I've got 10. What's happening today? Today is a Tuesday. These customers have all come from different, they've come from different, two have come from Manchester. Oh, what's going on? Is something going on in Manchester? Depending on the frequency, you could bog down, you can get bogged down in, in looking at the metrics every, I'd say minimum once a week. And it could be 10, like 10, 15 minutes once a week, but looking at some of the key metrics across those key areas. So again, if you're a lending business, okay. What's the change in lands 
to the website. How much has conversion gone up or what's the conversion percentage? You 10, 10% is good, right? If you land on, if you're landing on a website and you sign up, if 10 out of hundred people sign up, that's quite good. Okay. It's 10%. That's good. Has it gone up or down from last week? Not really. How many people have clicked on this once they've started? How many people have gone through the tutorial? How many people have taken out five ads? I think those kind of things, looking at an overview at least once a week, and then maybe once, once every few weeks, doing a deep dive into things that are of statistical significance. So again, if over the course of six weeks, you get a massive spike in conversion, I, I would look at that. I'd say, is the spike in conversion down to has the sales team onboarded five customers and they've all just come through the website. Again, you have to dissipate some of that information to get proper attribution. Or has it, is it that, oh no, we've had a huge, but a huge spike in people landing on the website, but they've all come from a specific conference that our company was at this week, which means they're almost like warm leads, which means they've got higher, a higher chance of conversion. Or is it something else? And you look into the metric, you dive into it. Yeah. And, at least once a month doing that, but at least once a week just looking at. And then it's about setting up a dashboard. And the same with a car. I'll use another analogy just before we finish. The same with, again, the same with a car. How do you, a car is running efficiently and optimally? Well, you drive it, you, you, to a sense, you'll feel it, but you'll see all of your, your widgets on a dashboard. The, how much, what the oil level is, what nowadays, what a tire pressure is, last service day. Like there's so many stats there that you can look at and go, oh, I'm doing fine, I don't need to do anything. But having that dashboard is crucial really to knowing, to creating an optimal product. Yes. Thank you, Jazz. This is such an important, relevant in, uh, conversation because if we want to make impact, like we really need to understand the how to look at our numbers, the what we need to track, the how we need to measure them, the common mistakes, how AI will impact them. And before we go, I want to put you in the hot spot and ask a few fireside questions. We've already answered some of them, so I'll just make this like short and sweet. So assume your customers are listening now. What would you tell them? What I tell them? Okay, I'm going to cheat. Read my newsletter, especially if you want a deep dive on metrics. So I've written a very deep dive on all of the types of metrics and, and how to actually measure them. We haven't touched on customer acquisition cost. We haven't touched on customer lifetime value. We've touched a bit on conversion, but what's good conversion? There's a lot there that we haven't touched. And also it's in, in different areas, metrics during discovery design and build are different to metrics that you'll prioritize when you're trying to scale a business, right? When you're trying to scale a business, you're not just looking at the number of customers. You're trying to look at the customer acquisition cost and getting that down. Um, you're looking at customer lifetime value, uh, retention. So go read that newsletter for a very d a deeper dive in those different phases. Sorry for cheating. Cool. Why do customers go to you and not your competitor? Because I don't think there are many people out there that have the depth and breadth of experience that I have and I guess unique communication style. So I'd say come to me because you'll get deep expertise and it's an area that it, I'm not just a deep expert. I love building fintech products. It's, I write about it pretty much every day. I read about it. I'm speaking to fintechs on a daily basis and I'm I just love doing it. Coming full circle, it's my purpose. So, so it, it's something that's embedded in me. It, I want to solve problems for fintech founders, for heads of product, for chief product officers, unblocking them as much as possible and helping them build better products. That's my, that's my raison d'etre. That sounds, that's like a beautiful way to go towards the end. So given your purpose. What are your top challenges then? Top challenges. I think it, it's difficult to scale myself. That's my biggest challenge if, I, if I'm being honest. And there's so many interesting 
things being built. Like again, I talked talk to fintech founders on a daily basis. There's so many interesting things being built up. I want to help with all of them, but it's not just not possible. So I'm I'm thinking of ways like how how do you scale your own expertise? Yes, that is often through written content that kind of lives in a place mm. that people can refer back to. But I'm thinking of other ways to try and scale my expertise in a way that is is accessible to more people, accessible and useful to more people so that they could build better products that but don't necessarily need to have me in their business every single day. So yeah. that's so that that would be the top challenge for me. Which is a good challenge. And then why could those founders need to hire someone like you instead of hiring their product team? I'm gonna talk myself out of work by saying they should hire a permanent product person. <laughs> Always my recommendation, whatever business I go into my first question is, well, why don't you have a product person right now? And usually the response is, or not usually, sometimes the response is, we don't really know what good product looks like. So we don't know how to hire a good product person because we, we've not had one or we just don't know what that looks like, what kind of impact they'll make. So we want you to come in and do some work so we can see what the impact is to see if it's worth it. And then sometimes it's like it, it, again, really early stage companies. One of the founders is usually the product person and I will help them hire out a product team. Think. Yeah. Yeah. Think about product. Think about what the product team will look like over time based on what they're trying to build, based on the roadmap, based on their overall strategy. And it's usually when they're fundraising because if it's two founders, one of them is doing either technical stuff or they're doing hands-on work and one of them's raising. If it's one founder and they're raising, all they're doing is raising. There's no there's no time no, to do product work. No work. Yeah. So then what ends up happening is that person will the founder will go do the fundraising work, but meeting commitments and then raise. Which means head of engineering or CTO is left doing the product work, which means that they're doing two jobs essentially. So usually when I get brought into, especially the smaller end, it's filling a gap that they don't necessarily have or testing the water of like, what does, what does product, what does good fintech product expertise look like? How is this going to work long-term? And actually we need help building this team. We don't know, do we need a product owner? Do we need a product manager? If we've got product owner and product manager, do we need a scrum master? Um, what about project manager? What's the difference? Let's, we won't get into it now. What's the difference between a product manager and a project manager? So it, it's sometimes it can be a confusing space. And so that's where I'll go in and say, back to your question, you should have a product person that should, product person should be embedded in your business, a permanent number of staff, especially at the early stage, have skin in the game because it's an intense job but an alternative is to bring me in and to, to ease that transition into their first hire sure. and sometimes it's their first hire to their second hire because their first yeah. again their first hire might be founder co-founder first time they've really done product and then and the first the, the first product hire is okay how do I build a product team now I don't know what I need. I'm, I've always just done product as the co-founder or as the founder. Now we need a scalable roadmap. Now we need engineering team is growing. How do we manage scale? So yeah, it's, yeah. My recommendation is always get a per person in, but I'll try and understand their problems and go, here's what I can help with. This is how long it's going to take. And I'll help you hire your first person, or it could be a 10th, 15th, 20th, 30th person. Perfect. So my favorite question that I ask everyone, if you were to change one thing in FinTech, if it's one thing that could make the lives of customers, employees, and shareholders better, what could that be? That's a hard one. Uh, it is a hard one, yeah. We'll have to pause there because I need to think about that. It's okay. We have to change one thing. Oh. One thing. I think, why don't we work, work back 
from customer impact. So you're saying if you have to change one thing that's going to benefit customers, one thing about fintech that's going to benefit customers. Customers, employees, shareholders. Yeah. I like the idea of consumer duty. Consumer duty in the UK is regulation that's been brought in to make regulation, legislation. It's not regulation. I think it's guidelines that have been brought in that big organizations have to adhere to, but small organizations also have to adhere to, that basically outline how to build better, more impactful products. And it, it goes from start to finish, like you, you should only be building products where there's research that indicates that there is a need for this product. You need to define your customer base more effectively. You need to out, part of consumer duty is actually measuring success. So a huge part of consumer duty is, is, is measurements and metrics. So I guess my response is something that already exists. Now, the, the question is, is how is that going to be adhered to by organizations? Yeah. Is, does it unfairly punish smaller organizations mm -hmm. that are innovating? And, and how do you hold big, or, big organizations to account? Personally, I think over time, what will happen is the FCA will just go into organizations and go, look, here's our consumer duty checklist. It's, it's red, amber, green. It's amber. Here's what you need to do. I think the thing that will improve outcomes for customers is already there. I'd say it depends on if, if it's implemented correctly and if there are, I guess, de de deterrents to not doing it, then I think that will lead to better, better outcomes. This is all, this kind of thing is something that I have done for organizations before. I've literally gone into an organization and gone, you need some sort of product health check because at the moment. You're building products and churning through, like churning through weeks of sprints, not really making an impact. You're not doing any proper discovery. So you again, you're building products off like theories and you're not measuring output. So you you're just spinning in the same place, building, but not really moving. And so I've done it before. I've come up with a five page PDF, different areas of the product, different areas of improvement across process across tools across strategy and customer outcomes and the red amber green here's where you're really good here's where you could do an improvement here's the red bits that like, you really need to address right now and then top to bottom list them out so could you do that it does that it's just let's see if let's give it a couple of years let's see if it actually changes the industry for good yeah amazing just it's been an absolute pleasure having you in the show again Thank you so much. Awesome. So good to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. See you next week. Ciao.